I had heard of many stories and rumors that there was a secret hidden story behind Wooly Wonka, but I had never really believed them. I had thought of them to be nothing more than mere jokes or fan fiction. You know how people like to take things that are normally thought to be happy and whimsical, like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and label Wonka as some sort of pedophile or some shit like that. I never took anything like that seriously and just thought them to be things people with active, alright, creative minds have come up with. I always just thought of the Wonka story as being nothing more than a happy and innocent story made for children to enjoy. That was what I thought, until this one day I decided I would actually find a way to find out for myself. I had decided to mail someone who was once acquainted with doll. I was told not to give anything about this person away, just to see if any of this was true. Considering nearly everyone had said something about this story obviously having some sort of subtext about it, I thought I would check to be sure. I was told in the mail, and I quote, You seem interested in this subject. Many people prefer to speculate, but you are the first one who seemed genuinely curious. Seeing as you want to know as much as you do, I will send you a tape in the mail. Check it within a week. But it was a couple days or so when the tape finally arrived. It had the words, Wooly Wonka True Story, on it, written in black marker. The only other words on this were it being copyrighted as 1963, a year before the book had come out. At first I had thought it strange, considering VHS tapes were not around back then, then it occurred to me that it was possible it was on film and put on tape later. So I stuck the tape in and played it after rewinding to make sure. It started out a bit odd. For one thing, it immediately went into the title, taken directly from the first edition book cover with no fade. It just sort of popped in, causing me to jump. What also made me jump is what came after that. The delayed yet abrupt appearance of the music, which was loud and sounded like some fast angry jazz music. Anyway, it went on to the credits and it showed names I had never seen before. The only names I was able to recognize were Dolls, Patricia Niels, and some guy named John Black. It kept looping back at the name of the animation checker about 15 times. I genuinely thought there was something wrong with the tape. Right as I went to take it out, it had popped immediately into the outside of the house of the buckets, with a camera zooming in. The art style was really weird. It was black and white and had an odd misty or cloudy look about it, cross-hatched. There was a deep male voice that seemed most likely to be the narrator, but his voice was in horrible quality. It was muffled and in such low volume I could barely make out a word he was saying. It cut inside the bucket's house and the misty cloudy look was even weirder here. The people moved all watery-like and wouldn't stop moving, much like those old Zelda CDI games, but the shaving was cross-hatched, which meant there was a lot of extra movement. Sometimes it was hard to make out what was going on. The characters behaved oddly. It seemed Charlie was either gay or highly effeminate as he spoke with a girly voice and spoke of his love for dolls and princesses. And it seemed everyone feared Grandpa Joe. We find later that he was involved in World War I, and it is never explained how, but it seems clear he was responsible for ending it. His parents also display odd behavior. The dad seemed depressed, and the mom seemed paranoid and suffered some major form of obsessive compulsive disorder. The other grandparents never spoke at all. From here on out, it is not too different from the book except for the characters and the fact that Charlie sings songs about his dress he wishes to wear. The story about Wonka is slightly different. Apparently, he is a Grinch and happened to appear out of nowhere suddenly owning an impressive factory that no one saw being built. Seems here no one worked in his factory, nor that it ever had any problems causing it to shut down. But when Charlie finds the ticket, it happens halfway through the finding. Also, we don't see any of the other kids giving their interviews as they win and the message on the ticket found in the book or any other film adaptation is absent. In fact, the ticket is blank. No mention of it being gold, but it's black and white, so it is hard to tell anyway. So anyway, the big day came and everyone is waiting at the gate. It's very similar to the book version, except there are six kids and Charlie is wearing his dress. The lines spoken by the people are slightly changed from the book. Halfway through, there are talks of Wonka being a Grinch, how his factory got there and how they got made, and there is a story about Prince Pondicherry's death having died drowning in Wonka's chocolate waterfall. 
They talk about more stuff, but then it seems the wind picks up, drowning them out, though nothing is ever seen blowing, just the sound effect of a howling wind. Then there are bells that chime for when it is time for the gates to open, just like the hook. Surprisingly, I can hear it over the loud howling wind. But it hits me the chimes are not church bells like the hook describes, but funeral bells. Very weird. But this is not the weirdest part. The weirdest part is Wonka himself. When the doors swing open you can see a dark shadowy figure stand at the doorway and then Wonka comes out of the factory hopping and prancing. He certainly does not appear human, though it is somewhat hard to tell due to the style of cross-hatching and the lack of color. Again, this isn't the weirdest part. The weirdest part is his eyes. He had a reptilian stare that quite literally sent chills down my spine. His hair kept moving, but not because of the constant motion and cross-hatching. It just moved like he was underwater. The wind was even louder now as he pranced and hopped down towards the gate. Once he arrived, he spoke. Strangely, I could hear his voice loud and clear, even though the cheering and talking from the audience was barely audible. His voice was high, like explained in the book, but not the kind of high voice I expected. He sounded like Michael Jackson speaking seductively. As normal, the kids had to show him their ticket, in which he stuck down his pants, then they walked inside. It wasn't that different from the book from here on except for when they started down the hallways, which looked like demented Tim Burton-style artwork. They keep getting more narrow and keep sloping down more and more the further they go. They also seem to twist more as they get into each new hallway. The weird part is that there is no dialogue here except the line from Veruca about needing to use the loo, which her father tells her that probably won't happen until the end of the tour. There is also a slow rising of the howling winds from earlier. I found it strange that such a thing would appear inside the factory. They entered an even more twisted and looped looking hallway with funeral bells chiming once again. The odd thing is that the art style once they entered this room has changed completely. While still remaining cross, hatched and wavy animated, it now fully looks like something Tim Burton might draw. The narrator from earlier also returns, but he was somewhat clearer. I could tell it was the same voice clip from earlier as I recognized a few of the same inflections. Oddly, he didn't seem to have been talking about the buckets like I would have expected for the intro. I still found him hard to make out, but I managed to catch a few words such as Grinch, Wonka, and he went on to something about the Oompa Loompas. At this point, I had goosebumps. I actually did not want to know what he was trying to tell here, but I was still very curious. Then, everything gets interrupted by a long message found on a black screen with white text. The writing was in another language. It looked like an odd mixture between Greek and Korean, but somehow managed to look like Black Hatter ITC font. There is no sound at all here. Everything is in total silence, though the howling wind show up abruptly a couple minutes in. I expected it to return to the show here, but it went on a few more minutes until it returned back to the show. They continued to walk through the twisted halls, this one looking particularly messy, shadowy figures of one kind the gang walking through. It changes to a side view, and everyone is still black and shadowy, one guy is still hopping, down until an abrupt change as the funeral bell sound again, now he is walking slowly. The way he was walking, reminded me very much of the Undertaker, from WWF, specifically in his Ministry of Darkness days. Other than the obvious, what is also freaky about it is the fact that it happened abruptly, with no transitional frames. There is, again, no dialogue aside from one of the kids, I assume a girl, saying, I don't like this, daddy. Now they suddenly walk through into the chocolate room, no door or entrance, they just walk in. All sound is gone, and each one that actually shows up is distant and echoey. When they get here it starts to get really strange. The room looks eerily identical to the one in the 2005 Tim Burton film adaptation and is not cross-hatched, but in what looks like a black and white painting style, the Chocolate River. This is one of the more unsettling moments, because the river looks like real blood, the only colored element in the entire film. Not blood, done in realistic style, but as though someone actually dipped a brush in to a cup of blood and ran a brush across those parts. What made it more unsettling is that its textures would change slightly with each frame. 
Why unsettling, as how they were able to get so much blood to make up each, possibly, 700,000 or more pieces of paper? But that isn't the weirdest part, it gets worse. The room doesn't seem to function like normal, as Wonka is not introducing anyone to the room nor showing them around. He suddenly starts speaking about the Oompa Loompas, a group of black pygmies he had smuggled from Africa, illegally, he adds. They are then shown, but the unsettling part is the fact that, unlike in the book, where they are happy, cheerful, and always singing and laughing, they look miserable, and each time they look at Wonka, they look terrified, they give him a look that basically says, Please don't kill me. I actually heard one say that, though I couldn't quite tell if he said, kill, as he was far away and was sobbing. It had more of the sound of, ack, rather than, kill. The camera, from this point, stayed at a bird's eye view. One of them yelled angrily at the Oompa Loompas, with a ridiculously loud voice. It was loud, high-pitched, and screechy, I couldn't even understand him, he could have been speaking in another language, for all I know. Then, he turned back to his guests and he said something about them that sounded so shockingly and despicably racist. But then, it continued to get worse. By the end, what he had ended up saying about them was just plain abysmal as well as slightly terrifying. I won't even repeat it. It was so that even a white supremacist would be offended by it. Now, I'm also not that super sensitive politically correct type that thinks blacks can do no wrong, not racist either, but even I was distraught about what he had said. The salts were revealed to be racists, not surprisingly, but even they were offended. Anyway, the old Viking boat arrived but it had some odd reptilian designs about it. The gang got in and I heard Veruca say, Daddy, I want lots of things, but I do not want a dreadful boat like this. But that was all I could hear. The gang did talk but their voices were drowned out by a group of crying oak malumpas and the overly loud sailing of the boat in the chocolate blood river. They ended up going through a dark tunnel and it was very close to the one in the film with Gene Wilder, you know, that psychedelic tunnel ride. But I could barely make out what any of them were as the style made everything look so convoluted. Veruca commented about her underpants being drenched in pee. The sixth child was another girl who spoke some of Violet's lines from the film, What is this, a freak out? I was absolutely baffled as to who this was, though. I also noticed that Justice was gone, though I assumed he fell into the chocolate river. Anyway, Wonka sang his rowing song, like in the film, but he sang it closer to how Marilyn Manson sang it, but with extra vibrato. The fast angry jazz music from the intro shows up once again. It seems odd and out of place. I kept seeing the letters J.V. pop up in the background, John Black. And then the images become clear. The background images show Oompa Loompas crying and some are singing something in some kind of African language. Then Wonka's song starts turning into some kind of bizarre language. It sounded like some kind of Yiddish chant until halfway through where it starts to have a slight hint of German in it. His eyes get bigger, his mouth grows larger, and his teeth make a sudden change to being sharp and snake-like. Then it pauses right on his face for a few minutes and the funeral bells return. The narrator from the beginning shows up again, but halfway through, rather than starting out from the beginning. His voice is now very clear. He mentions the Oompa Loompas being illegally smuggled from a deep dark forest in Africa and what peaceful lives they lived, but there was shocking mention of horrid things Mr. Wonka did to smuggle them. Again, I will not repeat them. He is about to speak about what happened to them and how the factory got there, but it immediately skips into a room where I can barely make out anything going on. Had no one said anything about it, I would have never guessed it was the inventing room. From here on, it keeps just skipping to different rooms, each child disappearing each time. Here, however, it seems no one knows how they disappear. The sixth child, I still don't know who she is. But I think I heard someone refer to her as Miranda, unless that was the name of one of the parents, whom are mostly unnamed in the book, but I am pretty sure they were referring to this mysterious sixth character. At least she spoke when the name was said, but there were funeral bells here, so it was hard to hear if she responded to them. Anyway, the last room they appear in features Wonka making sick powder. This sixth girl does not seem very pleased about it. Wonka gets extremely angry about this and shouts angrily right in her face. 
Once again, wow, it screechy and unintelligible. The fact that it was not distant made it even worse. It sounded so loud it even echoed through the room. Then, the girl runs inside the door in where it's being made. Then it cuts to Wonka's face slowly zooming in closer and closer. He has a huge rapish grin about him. Very spooky. I hated to keep looking, but I had to see what was to come, so I reluctantly did so. Some weird noises that resemble one of those creepy background sounds you hear on something like the History Channel, maybe you know what I am talking about, are heard but they are kind of muted and muffled sounding. Wonka's face, once it zooms closer, starts to show some disturbing texture. Looks kind of reptilian. But it appears his eyes are slowly getting whiter, his pupils slowly morph into slits, and his teeth, once again, become sharp and snake-like. Then, everything goes silent as the black screen with white text appears once again, and, as last time, looked half Greek half Korean. Then, Wonka began to chant something in what sounded like Yiddish. It was clearly a different chant than last time. Then it showed hints of German in it, albeit more so than last time. The text then flickered to an English translation, but it happened way too fast, too fast, for me to stop it and read it. Then it went back to where it was, and it was a still picture of a group standing around the room with nothing but funeral bells being heard. It lasted a few minutes, then it started to go in motion again once the funeral bell sounded. I then heard someone shout, Miranda! So this is her name. Anyway, these two ran off into the room as Wonka stared down at Charlie. Honestly, I had practically forgotten he was here, because he was barely shown throughout the whole thing. In fact, Veruca and this mysterious Miranda girl were shown the most. I almost felt like Mike and Violet were not even in this one considering their names were never spoken. I had also forgotten that he was in a dress. I probably thought it was Violet or something. I heard him speak again and remembered he was gay or highly effeminate. Wonka went on telling him he won, but instead of taking him directly through the great glass elevator or whatever, he told him to wait a minute. He then hopped off into another room. He found every one of the other kids in here except for Miranda. He said something that I did not quite understand. It was English, but it had a rather convoluted meaning. The children lying down on the floor could be heard crying and moaning, similar to the Oompa Loompas. The parents could not be seen anywhere. He then turned on the radio and slowly began to strip. The one thing that gave me goosebumps is what was playing on the radio. Melodically, it reminded me a lot of one of those songs you would hear in an old Mario game when you fight Bowser, despite it being in that typical style you often heard during the early 60s such as the Beatles and the Monkeys, but it was one singer only. It also sounded as though the keyboardist did not know exactly how to play it right. But that wasn't the weirdest part, the weirdest part is this. It sounded distorted and like an old radio, like it was from the 60s, and it was more in the background so it was a little hard to hear, also because it wasn't super loud. Anyway, I couldn't pick out the exact lyrics but I did hear he mention some freaky shit that would happen to a bunch of different people by 2014. It was like a bunch of random names being spurted out, but he obviously seemed to know who they were. What they were going to have happened to them are too horrible to mention. I don't even remember half of them. It took a second for me to sink back in to the video as my mind drifted away being absolutely stunned by the music. When I did, I saw Wonka take off his shirt and throw it off and then finally slowly drop down to the ground. After that, the credits rolled. All sound was gone from here. Appearing again were the odd names from the intro. I kept it rolling to see if anything came on after this, only to find a message placed at the end here that seemed to have been put in later as the look, quality, and style of it had an early 90s feel to it. It read, Don't let Felicity know, and then the tape stopped. I had not known who Felicity was until I looked it up. I found out that was the name of his second wife. As you may guess, I was quite shocked by what I had seen, but also relatively confused about what any of this was. I went and asked this person that had sent me this tape, who told me. Obviously, this was how Dahl had originally written the book. He always made films of these books before he wrote them so he could keep track of every idea he had and also check and see if these lines these characters spoke worked outside of just being read. What happened from there and how it ended up the way it was, I really do not know. I did not know him long enough. 
but I started to question the man after I got a hold of this tape. I then asked if this person wanted this tape, but this person refused and seemed glad enough to get rid of it, but still did not want this to be gone forever. Still wanted the proof and information to stick around, I guess. Ever since I saw this tape, I had been looking around to see if I could get any information on it anywhere, and so far, I cannot seem to find anything. Until recently, it was thought that Matt Groening had completely recovered from whatever was making him act so strangely during the Dead Heart incident and that it had affected his normal life afterward. Recent claims from the employee who found the Dead Heart video, however, indicate that Matt Groening went through another similar incident ten years ago. It was the summer of 1999 and Future Emma had recently premiered. Matt was working on two shows now and had started showing signs of stress when he announced that he was working on another episode that would be 100% of his own writing. This terrified some of the staff who worked on both shows, but they were hesitant to bring up Dead Heart and the future Emma crew saw no reason to reject Matt's idea. An early version of it was made and the employee who found Dead Heart managed to make a digital copy of this as well. The episode was called Not Long Enough. The episode started with Fry, Leela, and Bender making a delivery for Planet Express. They never revealed exactly what they were delivering or where they were going, and everyone seemed to be upset about an unexplained event that had happened recently. Leela and Bender were angry at Fry, who kept apologizing but was coldly rejected by his friends. They eventually reached a planet that seemed to have only one house, surrounded by empty, desolate fields on all sides. They knocked the door and a grotesque alien that seemed to be very old answered. He took the box without a word. He opened it, took a knife out of it, and stabbed himself. The Planet Express crew didn't seem to find this odd or surprising. They simply left the body on the ground and walked back to their ship in silence. The next scene was of the Planet Express ship flying through space. A dissonant piece of music made of extremely loud instruments playing a very slow tune played in the background while the ship flew through an empty, black space. They finally reached Earth and landed in a deserted new New York. Fry started apologizing again as they walked through the empty streets. There was no sign of the Planet Express building, but Leela and Bender glared at him in silence. Fry gave up and separated from his friends. He walked for quite a while, never encountering a single person. He reached the cryogenics building where he had been frozen, looked inside, and began to cry. The crying went on for a few minutes before he entered the building. Fry went to one of the tubes, set the timer on it to a huge number with more zeros than I could count, and locked himself in. The screen faded out and when it came back in, the view was entirely on Fry. The machine must have partially stopped working as parts of Fry were decaying. Bone was poking through his skin in several places. Fry mumbled, it's what I deserve, and climbed out of the freezing device. He was in a surreal, indescribable place. There were a huge variety of shapes and colors, but it wasn't bright or fanciful. It was closer to the faint colors you see if you close your eyes too hard. Fry started walking, the surreal void he was in seeming to go on and on. He kept walking for a few minutes. The colors kept making shapes you could kind of make out, but none of them were pleasant. After his long walk, Fry found a picture on the ground. It was completely out of place in his new environment. It looked like something's wrong in the normal future Emma style. It was a photo of himself, Leela, and Ender. Fry looked at it for a few seconds before beginning to cry again. The picture soon turned to dust and Fry continued walking. The view zoomed out until Fry couldn't be seen until the colors all blended together and turned to solid black. The view continued to zoom out and we see that the black was a tiny fragment of the pupil in Fry's eye. His frozen body had fallen out of the freezing unit and was lying in an abandoned room. He was drawn in the same hyper-realistic style as Bart's corpse from the Simpsons episode, Dead Bart. Bender and Leela walked into the room. They saw what Fry had done to himself and Leela said, he got what he deserved. She checked her watch and said, looks like we need to leave for our next delivery. She took a knife out of her pocket, put it in a plain cardboard box, and headed to the ship.
Now, do any of you remember those Mickey Mouse cartoons from the 1930s? The ones that were just put out on DVD a few years ago? Well, I hear there is one that was unreleased to even the most avid classic Disney fans. According to sources, it's nothing special. It's just a continuous loop, like the Flintstones, of Mickey walking past six buildings that goes on for two or three minutes before fading out. Unlike the cute sea tunes put in though, the song on this cartoon was not a song at all, just a constant banging on a piano as if the keys for a minute and a half before going to white noise for the remainder of the film. It wasn't the jolly old Mickey we've come to love either. Mickey wasn't dancing, not even smiling, just kind of walking as if you or I were walking with a normal facial expression, but for some reason his head tilted side to side as he kept this dismal look. Up until a year or two ago, everyone believed that after it cut to black, and that was it. When Leonard Malkin was reviewing the cartoon to be put in the complete series, he decided it was too junk to be on the DVD, but wanted to have a digital copy due to the fact that it was a creation of Walt. When he had a digitized version up on his computer to look at the file, he noticed something. The cartoon was actually 9 minutes and 4 seconds long. This is what my source emailed to me in full. He is a personal assistant of one of the higher executives at Disney, an acquaintance of Mr. Malkin himself. After it cut to black, it stayed like that until the sixth minute, before going back into Mickey walking. The sound was different this time. It was a murmur. It was in the language, but more like a gurgled cry. As the noise got more indistinguishable and loud over the next minute, the picture began to get weird. The sidewalk started to go in directions that seemed impossible, based on the physics of Mickey's walking. And the dismal face of the mouse was slowly curling into a smirk. On the seventh minute, the murmur turned into a blood-curdling scream, the kind of scream painful to hear, and the picture was getting more obscure. Colors were happening that shouldn't have been possible at the time. Mickey's face began to fall apart. His eyes rolled on the bottom of his chin like two marbles in a fishbowl, and his curled smile was pointing upward on the left side of his face. The buildings became rubble floating in midair and the sidewalk was still impossibly navigating in warped directions, a few seeming inconceivable with what we, as humans, know about direction. Mr. Malkin got disturbed and left the room, sending an employee to finish the video and take notes of everything happening up until the last second, and afterward immediately store the disc of the cartoon into the vault. This distorted screaming lasted until 8 minutes and a few seconds in, and then it abruptly cuts to the Mickey Mouse face at the credits of the end of every video, with what sounded like a broken music box playing in the background. This happened for about 30 seconds, and whatever was in that remaining 30 seconds I haven't been able to get a sliver of information about. From a security guard working under me who was making rounds outside of that room, I was told that after the last frame, the employee stumbled out of the room with pale skin saying, real suffering is not known, seven times before speedily taking the guard's pistol and offing himself on the spot. The thing I could get out of Leonard Malkin was that the last frame was a piece of Russian text that roughly said, The sights of hell bring its viewers back in. As far as I know, no one else has seen it, but there have been dozens of attempts at getting the file on repetitive by employees inside the studios, all of whom have been promptly terminated of their jobs. Whether it got online or not is up for debate, but if rumors serve me right, it's online somewhere under suicidemouse.avi. If you ever find a copy of the film, I want you to never view it, and to contact me by phone immediately, regardless of the time. When a Disney death is covered up as well as this, it means this has to be something huge. Get back at me, Shrill. I've yet to find a copy of this, but it is out there. I know it. Giggling. Tittering. Snickering. Guffaws. Shuckles. Snorts. Ha ah, ha, tee hee, ho ho, ha ha, hee ha. A cacophony of laughter. All I wanted was for the laughing to stop. It started off simple enough. I had been sitting in a restaurant on the road for a garden scene company of all things when the waitress caught my eye. Tall, red hair, amazing body. She came over to my table and asked what I wanted and I made some half-assed joke in an attempt to spark conversation. She left. Politely at first, as if she'd heard this or something similar a thousand times before. 
Then, the left hurdled as if she was really getting the quip. It wasn't long before she was laughing uncontrollably, her curvaceous body jiggling until she fell to the floor in a giggling heap. At this point, I thought she was making fun of me. The other patrons and waits to flipped over. All eyes were on me and on the girl. Then, the man behind the counter started to chuckle. The children at the corner booth erupted in hoots and giggles. It wasn't long. Minutes, really, before everyone in the entire place was deafening me with a strange round of laughter and applause. I smiled, though my face was red and I felt like flipping the table. I nodded, waved, and said a variety of self-deprecating apologies, like, Thank you, I'm here all week, and, hey, can't blame a guy for trying, right? I'm sure they couldn't hear me over their own din. This went on for 10, 15 minutes, and the restaurant only fell quiet again once I had fled for my already damaged ego. On the streets, the bedraggled, drunken messes of nightlife wandered aimlessly from bar to bar. As I passed, they'd turn to look at me. They'd point. They'd laugh. There's nothing unusual about a drunk laughing at something that isn't particularly funny, but this was different. Everyone was doing it. When I walked past the large windows of the taverns and bistros, no matter how ritzy or hardcore the clientele, it was like walking past a television set. From the other side, large glass screens through which the entertained viewers witnessed the most amusing act they'd ever seen. It didn't stop when I heaved the garbage can through one of these screens. Patrons with rotten trash on their dinner plates or freshly broken glass on their clothes and in their faces. They just continued to react with glee. It was like my violent outburst was just the climax of some elaborate comedy routine. In the days that followed, it occurred to me that I could do anything. Anything. People wouldn't serve me. Cashiers fell behind their counters, doubled over. Waiters and bartenders dropped trays and glasses. Salesmen banged their fists on their desks, then their heads. All of them laughing, laughing, laughing. One man, a heavy set businessman with a cane. I think he actually asphyxiated and died right in front of me. I robbed a bank. It was the first thing that came to mind when I realized I could do whatever I wanted, and I don't know what that says about me. I walked into the place, and shouting over the echoes of happy, demented noises, I demanded two sackfuls of cash. The only problem with this plan, the only hindrance to this bold, epic crime, was the fact that they were more interested in throwing handfuls of bills into the air over my head than actually filling the sacks. I didn't need the money, though. As I came to realize, being stinking rich is pointless when you can just push past a quivering employee and help yourself to everything on the shelves. Later, I walked into the police station just to see what would happen. The reaction was predictable. As I freely moved about the most secure areas of the most secure place I could walk to, I even heard laughter coming from behind the closed door. When I poked my head inside, there I was, on a myriad of computer monitors where an endless loop of footage was playing. The bank heist. At first, the two cops inside were fiaxed on the screens, barely able to catch their breath. When their red, tear-streaked faces turned toward me, the real me, all they did was point as if to say, there's the guy, while their belly laughs grew louder. One thing I thought about, but something I'd never follow through on was the fact I could pretty much have anyone I wanted. Celebrities. Pop stars. Just random women I passed on the street. Anyone. As I say, that's not something I do. That's not me. But it did pop into my mind. Just as quickly, I realized that even if I was that sort of person who could possibly do that while being left at, what was so hilarious? I must spend hours in front of the mirror, trying to see what might look silly or strange. I wore all different clothes, I combed my hair differently, I tried everything but apparently I was still ridiculous. I stood on the rooftop once, planning to shout out at everyone below just to see what happened. Everyone seemed to go out their normal lives until I called to them. Then, they all turned at once. Just as quickly, I was assaulted by a volley of the noise I'd become accustomed to, ricocheting off the buildings around me. I was truly the town laughing stock. It seemed to get worse, as well. At first, I had to gain someone's attention for them to react to me. Eventually, however, all I had to do was crack the door or peer through my curtains and anyone passing, I would immediately snap their head to look at me. 
People started gathering on my lawn. Random assortments of housewives, bikers, children, grandmothers, anyone and everyone. They'd stand there in clusters, just waiting for any sign of me. Sometimes one or two would wander off, either out of boredom or some unknowable influence, but they'd always be replaced by the same or a greater number. I couldn't take it anymore. Months had passed, and I wanted to die more than I wanted to hear their obnoxious, guttural expressions of joy. I started shooting them. Pop. 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 One minute, laughing. The next, rings on the wall. They didn't duck or move away, they just stood there and looked down the barrel of my gun, my guns, since I could have whatever I wanted, and they'd just smile and excitedly wait for the punchline. It didn't matter who they were, how they looked, their age, nothing. I didn't care, because as far as I was concerned, these lobotomized chuckle zombies were already as good as dead to me. The most I could hope for now was some peace and quiet. It never ended, though. For everyone that went away, there was another, and another, and another. I caught on to something after the bodies started piling up. I started checking wallets. People were coming in from other towns, the year cities. All to see the famous laughing stock. All to point and snicker and hoot and collapse into a giggling heap. I checked one guy's ID and he was from the next state over. What the fuck? That night. The night I realized this would never end, I put a gun to my own head and pulled the trigger. I didn't have to think about it. I didn't leave a long, drawn-out suicide note to you as I'm sure it would just become a best-selling humor novel at this point. Click. Yeah. Out of bullets. Otherwise, how would I be writing this? I had convinced myself nothing would change, and that I didn't want to live in such a predictable, yet disorienting and disturbing world anymore. That's the point where everything changed. Since I tried to kill myself, nobody thinks I'm funny. They stare, leer, cock, peer, focus in. They watch, they study, they squint. Stalking, following, observing, they glare. They glare at me. They hate me now, and I don't know why. What did I do that's worse than gunning them down in the streets? Worse than stealing from and abusing them? Why are they looking at me with such hatred in their eyes? Is it because I tried to end the joke? I want the laughter back. What is the definition of insane? Is it losing your mind psychologically, or is it speaking about something nobody else understands? If I talk about conspiracy theories or aliens, would I, in my own way, be insane? Well, that's what people would think. What if in reality our everyday, normal, thoughts were thoughts of a madman? What if those who we classify insane are actually sane? I used to visit an asylum. I was a counselor in training at the time. I would go to the asylum and talk to the less insane patients. My job was to analyze their thoughts on certain ideas. My patient was a man named Alex. He was around his 20s and very quiet. When I first met him, I felt comfortable with him like if I knew him from somewhere. He was very tall and well shaved. If anyone would have seen him outside of the hospital, you would actually think nothing of him, he would be another regular person. When I first met my patient, I asked for his name. He said nothing. He did nothing. He was sitting with his hands on his lap. He had this look on his face, almost like had to say something. His eyes, I swear, if you could see them, dark brown, almost black. He had heavy black bags, almost as though he had not slept since he arrived at the asylum. Anyways, we were in a room, almost like the interrogation rooms you see in all those CSI shows, one long table and two chairs, one on each side. I was sitting closest to the door for safety issues. As Alex stared at me, I began to get this feeling. A feeling of anger. I cannot tell why I felt like this. It was odd and I tried to snap out of it. I started asking Alex questions so I would keep anger out of my mind. So, um, how are you today? I have asked him why he was in the asylum but the warden suggested to leave that question out. Alex kept staring. If you can hear me, move your left arm. He said nothing. Not even a single movement. He might have been deaf. Doubt it because he responded to the guards when they brought him into the room. Please, you are making my job difficult. 
At this point, I had no idea why I was even talking. I knew he wasn't going to respond. The room became quiet. I must have already been here for three or more hours. What? It has only been 30 minutes. What? It felt longer than 30 minutes. Ah. It must have been the atmosphere of the asylum. It's making me go. Insane. There it is again. This feeling of pure anger. I just realized I never lost eye contact with Alex. Weird. Like I'm glued to his eyes. Talk. I screamed as loud as possible. He wasn't even flinching at my screams. Is this why you're in here? You make people go crazy with your silence. My intentions were not to snap at him, it's just this anger. Why am I so angry? Maybe if I relax I'll feel better. I closed my eyes. I started to hear this sound of feet shuffling. Then, chairs moving, falling. I opened my eyes quickly, afraid of finding Alex in front of me. Instead, I found myself standing in front of him. Without thinking, I put my hands on his face. My thumbs were touching his eyes. I started to press my thumbs into Alex's eye sockets. I felt his eyes pop as I pressed hard into his sockets. After a few seconds I shifted my fingers into his mouth. I started to pull his mouth apart until the edges of his mouth began to rip open. His face was full of blood and I had a smile on my face. Smile? Why did I just do that? Why am I smiling? I stopped and felt scared. This wasn't me. I've never had thoughts of murdering anyone. I would never. I have never hurt anyone. Suddenly, I felt this sharp pain. I looked down and I was bleeding. The guards were now in the room and they shot me in the legs. Then it all came back to me. I had realized why Alex looked familiar. He was my neighbor's son. Alex was a schizophrenic. I used to push him around all the time. I remember one day he murdered his mom and was sent to a mental hospital, an asylum. This asylum. I hit the floor and vision began to blur. What happened? Said one of the guards. The counselor just killed Alex. I knew it. Alex was right. I was puzzled. What were they talking about? The guard went on. Alex kept saying the counselor was gonna kill him. But he never even met him. How would he know? Said the guard, confused. That was the last thing I heard. I passed out a second later. When I woke up, I was in a cell. My mouth was stitched shut. My cell was completely dark. No windows, no doors. Just me and my thoughts. How did Alex know I was going to kill him? I, myself, had no idea. All I know is that if Alex wasn't schizophrenic, the doctors could have avoided this. But I guess the insane are smarter, making them sane? Are sane people actually insane for what they do to ones labeled insane? I'm considered insane, and here I am, my mouth stitched and in a cell with no light whatsoever. I was put in here by the sane, and I'm thinking what an inhumane and evil thing done to another human. My acts are labeled as insane, and acts done to me are insane, also. At the end, there is no sanity. We are all insane, no matter how normal we seem.